So we can go ahead and start putting the gun back together. I'm going to move a few things out of the way for us to do that. First thing we're going to do is put our bushings back in. Just drop these guys back in here. Um, there's no exact order in which to do this. There are some things that obviously have to be done before other things. I would say it's probably a good idea to go ahead and run the wires before you go too far with anything else because it's just easier to get the wires in there if there's not a bunch of other crap in your way. So this is our uh, data cable, or I'm not sure exactly what the term is for this. It's got two different ends on it. This end goes into the trigger switch, just simply clips into there. Once that's in, we're gonna route these wires under this piece here. Um, you may need a dental pick or something to fish the wires down under there, but you can see. Uh, I have the benefit of having done this hundreds of times, so if it looks terribly easy, it's just because I've done this a lot. But that wire is going to route through that piece right there. There is a small um, channel that it's going to fit through here. And this is going to come down to here through another channel. There's a second channel here. So we're just going to make sure that the wire is tucked in nice and neat. You don't want to mash it with anything because there, it's obviously wire. And if you're too rough on it, you're going to put a, you know, a short in it and it's not going to work for you anymore. Um, the other wires you're going to need are the wires going to your motor. So these two wires are going to run through there as well. Um, like we were working on earlier, you saw we did this little channel in here, and this is where this pays off, is that it gives you a place to route the wires so that they are not in danger of getting um, rubbed on or chafed by your motor. So we're going to run them through this channel here. We're going to run the red wire out a little bit through that channel so it's got a little more clearance for the motor. You can see that fits through there. And then we're going to run our data cable through there as well. We're going to just sort of press it through onto the, uh, onto the power wires and then around the back here. So now when this is all properly routed, I'm going to get this in a little bit further. Um, we want this wire to actually go into that channel so that it's now flush with the uh, surface of the gearbox so that there's nothing for the, uh, the pinion gear to rub on, um, which is a problem because just through uh, vibration and that sort of thing can cause the pinion to just wear right through the wire and then you have all kinds of problems from that. So uh, now we've got it nice and flush in there and what we're gonna do, once we have that where we want it, we're gonna put the little clips in and uh, hold the motor or the, the motor wires and stuff in place. Um, this is where people get frustrated because it, it takes a little bit of uh, messing around with it to get the wires exactly where you want them. And a lot of guys will go in with their super glue or their hot melt glue and start gluing the wires in place because they don't wanna spend the extra few minutes um, routing the wires manually. And I can understand that because it, it gets irritating having to screw around with that. But um, from my perspective of having to work on these on a regular basis, I prefer to be able to get in and uh, work on it again in the future when the gun needs some, uh, some future repairs because it's just inevitable. Something else is gonna wear out and you're gonna need to get into there. So G&G's got these little clips, they just fit in. Um, I would also say when you're putting these clips in, don't be too aggressive. Put them in nice and easy. If it feels like they're going in hard, um, don't force it because if you're forcing them in, you're probably going to end up uh, putting a short in the wire and then you're going to have problems again. So just go nice and easy. You're not, if you're in a rush and you're trying to do this, you're probably not going to do yourself any favors. So take your time, you know, do it on a day when you're not stressed for time. That's probably where most people get into trouble with doing this stuff is they've get, you know, they're trying to get to the arena to, to play and they're all irritated because, you know, they just, they don't want to be screwing around with this. So they, they call, take all kinds of shortcuts and then you end up with problems. So take your time and do it right the first time and you don't have to do it twice. So now we've got our wires run through there. It's nice and clean. We've got more room for our pinion gear to now fit through the bottom of the gearbox and we're gonna go ahead and put the gears back in. Um, for the sake of argument, let's say that the 
um, shims were not on these particular gears and we needed to, to re-shim it to put it together. I just, I use a very simple system for shimming the gears. It's probably what most of the factories do, um, I would assume. I don't, I don't know this for, the fact, for a fact because I've never actually been to an airsoft factory, but having taken apart thousands of these and seeing what the shims are like on them, I think most factory shim jobs are essentially just a standard uh, shim. There are different thicknesses for these. This one is 0.16 millimeters or somewhere in there. This is not the most, this is one of those Harbor Freight uh, calipers. So, but it's a very thin uh, shim. So just go with your thinnest shims and just do the, an equal thing on both sides. We're gonna start with the spur gear. We're gonna put a shim on both sides of that, both shafts. So there's a shim on the top, there's a shim on the bottom. And I know a lot of guys are probably screaming at their computer right now, but that that's all you really need. These are guns that get used here at the arena on a daily basis and get the living crap beat out of them. And if it will work for this, it'll work just fine for your gun that you use once a week or once a month. So um, a lot of guys get into all this minutia with, uh, you know, shimming. You know, if you got the free time and you want to do that, that's fine. Go ahead and do it. But this is what we do. Um, so there's a shim on the top, one on the bottom. We have our bevel gear, and then we also have our sector gear. This is just a single sector gear. Um, we're going to add another shim to the bottom of it because it does not have a bottom shim. So I'm just going to grab a shim out of the box here. We're going to put the shim on the shaft. So now we've got our spur gear, our sector gear. I leave the sector in with the teeth on the bottom so it looks like a smile. And then we're going to add our anti-reversal latch. Anti-reversal latch has a little spring about the size of a human hair once again, very tiny little spring. That sits on the latch this way. You can see it fits around it. And then your uh, anti-reversal latch is just gonna simply sit in the little hole right there. This is what I love about G&Gs is that the tolerances are so good I can set that in there and it's sitting there. If you've ever put together a cheaper model, it's a real pain in the neck because you'll go to put that in there. You go to drop in your, uh, your bevel gear and then suddenly this thing just wants to pop out of place. G&Gs, you don't have that problem because they're so well machined. They just sit in place and you can just, okay, I'm done with that. Otherwise, I've seen somewhere you just, you're freaking holding this down with a finger and you're trying to put this other stuff because this just wants to pop out. This is why I love G&Gs because they are just engineered and machined very well. So here is, well, let's go ahead and get our piston. This is our cylinder and the cylinder head. We want to check that and make sure there's no damage to the little rubber bumper in there. That looks pretty good. I usually line up the port with the little holes on the front of the cylinder head. Um, remember that the port goes towards the rear of it. If you put it together this way, it's on the wrong side and all your air is going to blow out of your port. So you want to make sure that the port is towards the back of the cylinder. So that just drops in. Um, you also have your tappet plate and your nozzle. Nozzle just sits on a little channel on the tappet plate. This is going to fit onto your cylinder head. And then this just simply drops into place like this. You just want to make sure these holes are going to line up with these little pegs on your uh, gearbox shell. So you just get that all straightened out so you feel like everything is nice and solid in there. Your tappet plate moves nice and easily. Um, there's also notches here and here. You want to make sure that your cylinder is sitting perfectly inside of those notches so there's no play. And then we're going to just put our tappet plate spring back in. That's this little guy hooks onto your tappet plate there. And then I'm just going to use a dental pick to just stretch it back over this little peg at the front of the gearbox. And sometimes you can use a, a dental pick. In this case, I'm going to use a screwdriver to grab it. And we're just going to pull it up and over until it goes onto that little peg there. So now that is what forces your BB into the chamber. So that's connected directly to your nozzle. So that's in place. We've got our cylinder, or not our cylinder, this is our piston and piston head. We're gonna drop that in. That goes in place like that. We've got our spring and our spring guide. I'm just gonna just sort of set it in place there like that. So now everything's pretty much sitting where it needs to be. I have accidentally moved my 
one shim so I'm gonna pick that up and put that little puppy back on there so that sits on there so you've got shims sitting on all of those and then we're gonna put our trigger switch back in place um, this can be a little bit annoying if you haven't done one before um, once again with the GNG's they they generally tend to be pretty well engineered so it's less of a problem with these than other brands remember I had us cut out this little channel here that's because this little piece of the spring is going to fit into that little channel there and that's what keeps it all lined up so you've got a little like axle here and here that's going to fit into this here so we're just going to fit that little piece of the spring under and then this fits over and that's pretty much all you need to do and see hands free that's what i love about gng i'm not i'm not fumbling around with things that are flying out of place aside from this one little shim that does not want to stay underneath the uh, tap it plate but you know if that's the worst problem that I have with this gun I'll be uh, quite happy about it so then we're gonna put our spring guide back on this is where a lot of people get nervous you know you've just gone to all this work and now the thing could just fly apart if you're not holding the uh, holding it together properly I think as you build confidence you stop worrying about that as much and it's really not that hard to uh, to do all I do is just compress the spring into it this is a little bit of a pain in the neck if you're dealing with higher powered springs like over M120 because the spring wants to push itself back out. Um, if you're using a standard M100 or M110 springs, these generally will just go right into place. Just make sure that your piston is still lined up with the tracks that it rides on. I'm just holding it down with one finger just because it wants to pop up. So we just hold that down. I'm putting my finger through where the cylinder goes and I can just sort of line things back up this is the safety lever you're going to need to sort of grab that with the gearbox or with your thumb or whatever force that into place force your spring guide into place that drops in like that and one good thing to keep a razor blade for is lining up your uh, anti-reversal latch sometimes that doesn't want to just go right where it's supposed to so sometimes you need to fit in there with a uh, razor blade and then you can force the anti-reversal latch into the proper place what i'll do is i'm holding the the two halves of the shell together and just making sure that everything is moving properly the spring and the, the tappet plate is moving properly um, the trigger switch i can feel it actually pressing on the trigger there's a little click at the very bottom of it so i know that is properly aligned i can see all of the uh, gears are lined up with the bushings so I'm, I'm pretty confident that this is, everything is where it needs to be. You'll notice that the wires are now coming through the back of the gearbox here. And we're just going to go ahead and drop our screws back in and start reassembling the uh, outer portion of the gearbox. So I'm just going to drop them all in place while I'm just holding it down. I probably, you don't really need to put a lot of pressure on these. And once you get one screw in place, um, you're pretty much, you can stop worrying at that point. I'm going to turn the clutch all the way down on my drill gun here and that's it all right at this point we're going to go ahead and put our screws all back in like i said before i'm using the minimum amount of torque on the screw gun to make sure that all the screws are not getting stripped out um, to save a little bit of time i went ahead and got them all started so you get an idea of what's going on here um, so all the screws are now in place keep in mind that the shell of the gearbox is very soft aluminum zinc alloy so it's very easy to strip this out so um, just use the least amount of torque it takes if you really want to be careful just use a hand screwdriver and do all of these by hand that way you don't accidentally over torque them and then strip out your gearbox so this is now reassembled uh, if you want to double check everything make sure that your trigger is moving freely that it's making contact with the trigger switch that your nozzle is moving freely that the tappet plate is pushing it back out and you could use like a little skinny screwdriver to make sure that the piston is moving freely inside of its tracks if anything does not move then that means you pretty much need to disassemble it and figure out what you did wrong but at this point we now have the gearbox fully reassembled and you notice the wires are now coming out the side of it so they're not going to cross over the motor as the motor goes through there what will happen is this guy will go into here and now those wires will not rub up against the uh the pinion gear and you won't have trouble with it shorting your wires out which is 
very helpful uh, if you're ever removing the motor. Just like I said in the beginning, make sure if you're removing the motor that you do that uh, without snagging your wires and then uh, shorting them out. So we're going to go ahead and put this all back together now. So we have our gearbox. We're going to drop that into our lower receiver. The two wires are going to go through where the grip is for the motor. And we have our other two wires that go through the rear. So we've got this. <coughs> Next thing we're going to do, the way I like to do it is to put these two pins in first before I go any further. Once again, the floral pin goes right here on the left side of it or on the port side of it, depending on which way you refer to uh, refer to it as, and then your receiver pin, your rear receiver pin is going to go through the opposite direction. So this goes through here. The reason I like to do these two pins first is if you go ahead and put the grip on first, the grip tends to pull because the grip attaches directly to the gearbox. It wants to pull the gearbox in this direction. So it can very easily make these pins not line up. So it's much easier to do if you put these pins in first and then tighten screws up. And also once you tighten that up, it also puts a little bit more tension on these pins so the pins don't wanna fall out. So the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do once you've gotten these two pins in is put your grip back on. There are, the large hole is where your motor is going to go through. These two holes on either side are where your wires are gonna go through. So your red wire goes through one here, your black wire goes through the other here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take something real quick and just make sure that my wires are pushed up and in and nothing is in the way of the motor. So this just slots onto your gearbox like so. Oh, one thing you have to do, uh, make sure that it doesn't grab onto the wires there either. So now we have our grip on there. There are four holes in there. I don't know if you could see that very well. Let me get my light on it. See if we can see in there, there are four holes. You just need to do the upper left and the lower right is the ones I do. You could do any particular order that you like. There's you know, no rules with that, um, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, that's generally the order that I do it in. There's no particular reason for that. It's just, I guess, sheer repetition is how I've been doing it. Um, if you have like a Lancer and you take your gun apart, you may notice that it has four screws in it, which is perfectly fine. You can use all four if you want. It's uh, not exactly necessary, but uh, feel free to leave all four of those in. There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of extra um, uh, screws in there to hold everything together. And we're just gonna finish screwing this together. All right, so the grip is now screwed down on there. You want them to be pretty snug. You don't want to over, once again, the, remember the gearbox shell is very soft metal, so don't be tempted to over tighten your screws. You want them to get them nice and snug, but not overly snug. If you're having trouble with the screws backing out, you may want to use a little bit of blue Loctite on them uh, to keep them from backing out. But uh, I would just uh, try to avoid the, um, the urge to over tighten your screws on it because in the long run, it's not going to be good. Uh, you have your motor, you have the red side and the, or the positive and the negative side, depending on how you want to look at it. On this motor, it's also got a little mark on it here. There's a small plus, so you can tell that this is the positive side, and there's also a red uh, marker on the one terminal here. So you have your two spade connectors there. So you want to run your wires down along the bottom down along the bottom and then up along the channel. You'll notice that there's a screw uh, here or where the screw fits into and that creates a channel along the side of here. You wanna have the wires so they ride up through that channel so they're not touching the motor. Reason is with the motor, you will have a spring on it, which I'm not sure what I did with my spring. Give me a second so I can find my spring. Here it is. So your motor has a spring that sits on it. Your motor is not in like a fixed position. The motor on a version two gearbox actually kind of floats. So this is gonna fit into there. You'll notice that the wires are going up along that channel 
along the back of it so the motor can actually float up and down inside of the grip. That's important to, to note. So we're going to go ahead and connect our spade connectors to the wires. They just simply press in like this. The red wire is going to go around the side of the motor and then up this way. So we're going to go ahead and connect it here and then we're just going to route the wire around the back side of it. So you can see how the wires look. One's coming up and around, the other one's coming up and in there. So, and the motor is free to move inside of the housing. So we have our little plate that has to sit inside of the motor plate here, the height adjustment plate that sits in there. It's probably good to sort of mate these two together all with one motion, otherwise that plate's gonna wanna fall down inside of the grip. So get that in there nice and straight. Um, drop your screws in. And once again, get one screw in and then you can stop worrying about it accidentally coming apart. Um, this particular one is using Phillips heads. Some of the G&G &G, uh, motor height plates will use Allen screws. Some of them will use Phillips head screws. Um, one thing I like about the G&G &G grips is that they actually have these uh, threaded bushings inside of there that the grip screws go into, um, which gives you a nice, um, nice surface to thread into rather than just plastic, um, which is very soft and very easy to strip out. So that is now reassembled. You want to make sure that your selector is moving freely. Um, before I go to the trouble of reassembling the rest of it, it's, I usually like to, at this point, test it out to make sure that everything is functioning. Um, so we're going to just go ahead and connect our motor connectors here. And we're going to connect our little data cable up here. And then... Once this is all plugged in, we're going to get a battery and we're going to try this out. I need a battery. <coughs> I just don't have a battery back there. All right, so we're going to go ahead and hook our battery up and test fire it, make sure everything is working properly, make sure we're not blowing any fuses. If you're blowing fuses, it's a good idea that something is really screwed up and you might want to go back and figure out where you screwed up. Um, most common uh, reason for that is you shorted out a wire somewhere and you want to go back and figure out where the wire got shorted. So let's see what happens. So you can see the gun is now working. You can see that the amount of trigger travel is almost nil at this point. It's uh, less than a sixteenth of an inch. So if you want a very fast trigger response, this is the best way to do it. Plus, like I said before, you're getting the added bonus of um, cutting the wear down on your uh, trigger switch. So your trigger switch will last longer. That is the one thing that I find that really wears out the fastest on these ETU builds. And if you can uh, do this little hack that I've come up with here, it will definitely um, extend the lifespan of your, uh, your gearbox and your, your electronics and all of that. So keep that in mind. So we'll just go ahead and finish this uh, assembly up. We're going to go ahead and put the mag catch back in. I'm holding this in with one finger while I drop the spring on it. We're going to put the button in place and just go ahead and tighten the screw down on that. Um, once again, it's good to have a magnetic screwdriver if necessary. Um, and now you know how to make one, just in case you didn't know before. Um, just all you need is a magnet, and you can make any tool into a magnetic uh, tool. And if you want to demagnetize it, I can share with you a little trick on how to do that as well. Um, it's a slightly different system, but what you want to do is depolarize the magnetic field on it. You do that by simply taking your tool and your magnet, and what you want to do is wave your tool over the magnet in a bunch of random ways so that it's no longer um, going to be magnetized, and then you can demagnetize it, and you don't have to worry about it grabbing metal objects if you don't want to have a magnetized tool. So let's go ahead and finish this up. We're going to have to disconnect this and run this back through. 
Um, we're going to start with our, this is the one thing I always seem to get to this point and forget, is to run the wires back through the um, sling mount here. I don't know how many times I've, I've run the wires through the buffer tube and it's like, oh crap. It definitely needs this little buffer on there to space everything properly. So that goes through there. The way G&Gs are, there's a notch cut into it so the wires run through that. We're going to then, what I'm going to do is take my MOSFET that has the circuit board on it here and I'm going to run this wire through this way. Run this down through. There's just a little teeny hole in there that these fit through so they're Definitely a bit of a challenge to get the wires properly routed on these from time to time. Um, you want to try to straighten it out as much as you can before you try to run the wires through. Otherwise, if it's got a big bend in it, it tends to be uh, a real pain in the neck to get that wire to run exactly where you want it. So I'm going to try to run this guy through here. So we're going to go ahead and connect our motor wires here. Those are now connected. All right, so that pulls through there. Do that. So now we've got our MOSFET. We're just going to go ahead and plug this in. When you get one of these from the factory, it's going to be fully um, encased in like a clear shrink tubing. So you, you'll have to get in there and cut away some of that shrink tubing so that you can get to these connections because they'll be totally fused inside of there. Um, put a zip tie on here, keep this all together. So that's onto there like that. So now you can stuff the wire down into the buffer tube. Oh, and one thing I didn't do is put the screw back in. So let's go ahead and get that screw back in there and then we can finish assembling this whole thing. Um, sometimes you just have to play a little bit of a game trying to get the screw right down the middle. It's not always the easiest thing in the world to get it to go in. Um, don't force it once again because there are wires running through there. If you uh, run it through the wires and end up shorting out your wires that will not end well. So just uh, take your time. This is a steel screw going into a steel spring guide, so you can add a pretty good amount of torque when you're torquing this screw down. So now you got your wires run. If you want to go ahead and put your stock back on, just run your wires through the stock like so. Um, this being the G&G &G style, it's got the pin that you just simply pull these pins down to uh, adjust the length of that. Um, and your upper receiver is just going to drop back on. We just need to get the, uh, the pin out of the way. On the G&Gs, the front pin is a, um, is a captured pin, so this is going to stay in place. We're just going to get it out of the way so that we can slide the receiver back on like that. Um, just watch your bolt catch that that's not in the way. And there's a little tab right here. You're going to want to get that up and over your cocking lever. If it's not going in easily, try pulling the cocking lever back a little bit. That usually uh, gives it a little more clearance. And then you can go ahead and push the pin back in. And if we did everything correctly when we put the battery back on it, it should fire right up. So there it is. That's how you do it. So uh, if you want to do this yourself, just follow our instructions. Take your time and, and do it. Um, if you're not comfortable doing it yourself, bring it to us. It's what we do here. Um, cost you a few extra bucks for us to do it. But as you see, we do a lot of these. So we kind of know our way around with them. And um, generally, you'll have less problems that way. So uh, feel free to stop into the store if you want to see about getting this done. And uh, as we go forward in the future, we'll probably do a few more mods that we've worked out for these guns to, to pick up the rate of fire, give you faster lock time, um, make the guns a little more competitive. Um, so stay tuned for that. So until the next time, don't let the bastards get you down.